Now everybody seems to be here, and we're going to move on to the next speaker, who is uh, educated as a political scientist, uh, but here uh, in another role, uh, he's one of the co-founders of the consultancy Alibier, which, as I understand, is Norwegian for alibis. Coincidentally, not entirely coincidentally, I suspect, um, who work with development and, anal and analysis of collaborative learning methods, including role play. He's also here uh, uh, in speaking uh, or in the role of a coordinator of a Norwegian NGO called Fantasieforbundet, the Fant Fantasy Association, um, that works with live role playing as a tool for strengthening civil society in places like Belarus, Lebanon, and Palestine. Please welcome Martin Nielsen. Thanks a lot, uh, Jock. I'm also here to, to ruin the friendly atmosphere by bringing no less than 14 pages of manuscript. And I will also use uh, absolutely no interactivity in this talk. So uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, for making sure that uh, I'm doing exactly the things you didn't come to get here at Alibis. <laughs> Alibi to participate, Alibi to take part, uh, it's something that we all try to create, but it can be really hard. Uh, in a room full of corporate suits or in a classroom with teenagers who are too cool for school, it's not always easy to create the atmosphere where people are playing. And the same is true if you are under oppression. And that is what I will talk about today, alibis in the shadow of oppression. While oppression might not be good for play, play is not good for oppression either. And that is one of the reasons why I believe it's so important to try to strengthen the opportunity to play in oppressed societies. So for the past five years, I've been part of a handful of projects through Fantasy for Bunna. Um, and I will tell you some stories about these projects today. But first, I'd like to just do a little survey, because I realize that this is probably the only talk that is about LARP. And it seems to me sometimes that Everyone here are LARPers, but then at the same time, I sometimes get the sense that this is not true at all. So I'd just like to ask you, who knows what LARP is? Can you raise a hand? And who has been to a LARP? So there is some... Uh, the, the, the audience is maybe split. I'll try to just very quickly explain that at a LARP, you play a character within a set framework, which is making up the alibi to play and there is no manuscript, so we don't know exactly what will happen, but there is a frame. I'd like to do one more survey as well, and that is, I'd like to know who have been to a country where people are oppressed? I know maybe some of you think you are oppressed everywhere, and, and probably you, perhaps you don't like Moderatana or something. Uh, in a way, we are all oppressed. Uh, who have been, are there anyone who have been to Belarus? Palestine? And Lebanon? A few. Cool. The first thing I will talk about is playing under political oppression. Because this adventure, it started out with Belarus. And we used to say that Belarus was the last dictatorship in Europe. That is not true anymore. They have some stern competition from Russia, Hungary, uh, probably more countries coming as well. But it's still one of the worst dictatorships in the world. And this guy, Alexander Lukashenko, he's been in power since the dissolving of the Soviet Union. If you disagree with him, then you'd better keep it for yourself, uh, at least if it has to do with freedom of expression or human rights, or you might find yourself without a job on the next day, or maybe without a place at the university, or even worse, if you're a young male, maybe you are sent away for some draconian military service in a faraway part of the country. And all this, it happens, of course, not because of your opinions. It's always because you didn't have the right stamp, or you came one minute too late for something, one time too many. In Belarus, they didn't even bother to give the same shit a new wrapping when they dissolved the Soviet Union. So the Secret Service in Belarus, it's still called KGB. 
but I'll keep it for that. It's not a lecture of Belarus. Uh, our partners here, they are an uh, educational organization and they work to promote active citizenship, critical thinking, these things. And they came to the LARP conference Knutepunkt in 2007 to see if LARP was something they could use in their work. And the initial response they got, it was more or less mostly about that maybe it's possible to conceal uh, political messages within some kind of uh, fantasy world or something. So Lukashenko's boys, they can be the orcs. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't so interested in that. They didn't think it looked so good. So and you see my design skills here with graphical design. But this is also because they said, we have enough orc LARPs already. Uh, we want to work with teachers and academics, not with kids. So how can we get these people on board? And at the same time, keep what we do acceptable for the authorities. Uh, under authoritarian rule, you don't only need the alibi to make people dare to play. You also need alibi in a more conventional way. You need to explain that what you're doing is not a crime or a threat to society. So the solution was to make a LARP, a historical LARP, about World War II with a clear educational profile. And if there is one thing Belarusian authorities love, then it's the Second World War and the stories about the Red Army who defeated the evil Nazis. 1943 was run two times. I didn't take part in creating this, but I attended the second run. And I can promise you that the Belarusians, they are not joking when they are making a historical LARP. For my own part, this is uh, probably the hardest LARP I've ever been to in, in the physical sense. And also the airline, they lost my luggage, so I didn't have any proper sleeping gear or anything for a November weekend in the Belarusian forest. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the food they had, and you can see it's, it's really authentic. It doesn't uh, resemble so much what we had uh, yesterday. But I would be really happy to have this food at the LARP. This is the Nazi food. I was there with the partisans, and uh, we only had uh, we had some cold buckwheat and we had some um, some cold lard speck, and that was all we had. And there were some chickens around too. If you wanted, you can slaughter one of them and get some meat. So it's quite authentic, and authentic uniforms, authentic weapon replicas was all part of making up the alibis for this LARP. The only thing the organizers didn't think of was that there might come some other people to the forest on a Saturday or Sunday morning to pick mushrooms. And I met these guys in the forest. And then uh, a few hours into the LARP uh, on the second day, I arrived a car looking like this. This is a police mashrutka. And it's virtually full of policemen. It's not like a driver and one more guy. It's every seat in the car there is a policeman and also a KGB officer. And um, they weren't too happy with this. Uh, fortunately, we had more than the main organizers. She had a big pillow under her dress because she was playing a pregnant character. So she went up to these people and talked. This is an official history group. We talk about uh, the struggle against the Nazis and na na na. Everything is okay. And in the end, they they actually let this go on and just gave a warning. Uh, thank God they didn't find out about the foreigners who were there. But what is this lot really about? Within the framework of 1943, it is about the suppression of the civilian population. It is about the Red Army and the way history is portrayed. Uh, the Red Army, are they only the good guys? What did the Red Army do? It is about the Polish partisans, about, again, history, presentation. The Polish partisans are more or less written out of Belarusian official history, but they played an important role during the Second World War. And it's even more about raising the awareness that in times of war, humans are humans, even the Nazis. And how do society respond when we behave like humans and we break the norms, we don't obey the rules? I have to admit we haven't been so successful in evading the, the, the rules in later years. So recently we are no longer allowed to work in Belarus and we have moved the activities in to Lithuania. But the people who live there, they still go on with this, and they have gotten really good at making these discrete workarounds so that they don't work with human rights, but maybe they work with human dignity. For example, a LARP about euthanasia has been very popular. And what we took with us from the first years is that political oppression, it, 
increases a lot the need you have for an alibi to play. You don't only need to overcome the social norms, but also the fear of sanction, and at the same time make this interesting and attract the audience you want. So this brought us into a new adventure. With the experience from Belarus under our belt at Knutepunkt, some years later, we met a lot of uh, Israelis, and there was a lot of discussion about Palestine and Israel and, and all these things. And, and we started out with working with the idea of making a project in Palestine, playing in the shadow of occupation. We thought that now we know how to do this, we know how to work under oppressive regimes, so this will not be too hard. <laughs> I will tell you first a little bit about, uh, not much, but Palestine, you probably know a bit about it already. This is a map of where the Palestinian Authority is having some kind of influence at the moment, the last map. Uh, the, the occupation on the West Bank implies severe limitations of civil rights for the Palestinian population, including lack of safety from arbitrary arrests. And of course, uh, there is the safety barrier or the wall, apartheid wall called by some, that heavily restricts the freedom of movement. These are just some examples. And uh, of course, for the citizens of Gaza, the situation is much worse. But I will keep this to the West Bank, which is where we have been working. Uh, so. This is quite inflammable material, and right after the conference, rumors spread in the LARPing community that somebody are planning to make a LARP about the Israel-Palestine conflict. And then, uh, when this came out, then people start uh, talking about it. So we got this post on a forum from, I don't know if you can read this, uh, but it's a quiz from an, an Israeli LARPer with questions such as, uh, uh, what was the nationality of the people of Gaza in 1915? Uh, what are the differences in the relations between Israel and the West Bank and Israel and Gaza? What is the first nation of choice for homosexual Palestinians? How many Palestinians were receiving medical treatment in Israeli hospitals in 2002, 2004 and 2006? Etc, etc. So obviously the Israeli audience were not too happy with the Scandinavian Besavisas coming to their part of the world to, to make something. And then he ends sarcastically, it would be easy to turn this into an orcs, Israelis, versus elves, Palestinians thing. I don't know what it is with the LARPers, they portray themselves as creative people, but I think we need some new inspiration when it comes to allegories. Uh, Anyway, it was never our intention to open a can of worms by going directly into making an allegory of the conflict between uh, Israel and Palestine. What we did was I went to Faris, the chairman of an NGO called Peace and Freedom Forum, a student organization, and I came to his uh, office in the outskirts of Ramallah, and he was chain-smoking while I was there with a book called Nordic LARP in hand, which Anna has been part of making. Uh, and trying to convince him about the greatness uh, of LARP and how this can be used for educational purposes and uh, training, telling the world about the occupation and the repression and all this we had learned from Belarus. And then at one moment, Faris is straightening up in the chair and he looks at me and said, Martin, you need to understand. If you want political discussion, I have a debate group for you. If you want to learn about history, I have a history group for you. If you want to talk about the occupation, and I have an advocacy group for that. But Martin, we need to live here. We need to play. We need to use our creativity. We are here every day, whether we like it or not. And our identity cannot just be to be the occupied. So let's just play and see if the Palestinians like your way of playing. And I was quite, uh, I was quite taken by this. I think it was a very beautiful thing to say, but at the same time very scary, because I realized everything we had learned from Belarus was completely useless. So Faris, he agreed to gather a group of people and we should organize a play day. And I would find the LARPs together with uh, Arne, who is here somewhere, and a few other people. So we had seven young men and two young women showing up. And I was a bit disappointed by this, by both the number and the gender balance, before I was told that the alibi to play for girls in Palestine is really, really weak. And they told me about a local drama school. They were using quotas to every year take in equally many female and male students. And they had a dropout rate of 100% among the female students. So everyone dropped out before finishing school. 
So with that in mind, I think we're quite lucky to have these two girls. And not all of these people were two good English speakers either, but we had translators and it, it worked. We, we started with some ice-breaking games and, we, we, and after a while we went into to the LARPing. And the first thing we did was playing a LARP called the Family Anderson. This is a LARP where we have teams, so two players share one character, and we use this to have the Norwegians and the Palestinians working together with one character. Uh, it worked okay, and we had some discussion and some talks in this LARP about sh some siblings splitting the heritage from their passed away parents. But the energy was really low. And then at one moment we realized, no, there are only Palestinian players in the scene, and we asked, can you please just play in Arabic and, and disregard us. And then these statues, they seemed to come alive and the energy was coming into them more and more and after a few minutes they were agitating like only Arabic people can do. So we, we thought, okay, we are nailing this, it's all about the language. And then we were really excited to go on and try out the next, next lob, uh, which is the Tribunal. This is a lob about soldiers in a dystopian society. Uh, they have a kind of a prisoner dilemma where someone has stolen food and it's about whether to turn in others or to not turn in others. They are also playing characters inspired by animals such as private mouse or private horse. And for this run we had modified it, we had taken out animals that Muslims consider unclean, so not to offend anyone, and we also decided to play it in Arabic to make it flow more easily. And it seemed to work, they played, they discussed, but then after 20 minutes everyone falls silent. And we, what is going on? We're waiting for a few minutes. It, nothing is happening. And we go in and ask, uh, why, why are you not uh, do, saying anything? What is happening? No, uh, we solved it. <laughs> solved it? Morans, you are, you are supposed to role play, not to solve it. Oh, oh great, you solved it. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, then we can, we can just uh, we can go on to the, to the last program item then. <laughs> So the last thing we were going to do, and at this time we were quite pessimistic about can this really work if they only want to, to solve things, but the last thing we had on the program that day was to make a LARP, and we used a framework called When Our Destinies Meet, where you have a very simple framework where you know there will be a party and you have some stereotype characters such as the boss, uh, the sibling, the blind date, the parent. And the participants, they started out this workshop quite uh, carefully. It was only to showcase an example of, of how you could make a LARP. And then they decided this will be a circumcision party. fast. And we were a little bit okay. Uh, and then it quickly started to escalate. It, it was the circumcision party of Dr. Durex, the owner of a condom factory. And not only would the president of Palestine be there, also CIA agents, secret lovers, and anti-condom terrorists will be at this party. <laughs> and, and alcohol would be served, and pig's meat too. And where did all this come from? And we didn't really know, where, how, how can we handle this? Are we creating a, a scandal now? Are we making LARP into something they will never ever do again? Or are they just tired and silly? Or what is this? But anyway, we've completed the workshop and it came to an end and we had this crazy framework. And we said, thanks a lot for staying here in the whole hot summer day. And now you can go home. And we reminded them this is just the tools and we hope it was useful even though we are not going to play. And then they spontaneously, what, are we not going to play this? Uh, and that was the moment we realized that we, we had seen just the birth of LARP in the Arab world. And it was clear to everyone that the questions, uh, that, that LARP was such a good tool to raise questions that they normally don't talk about. So for our next project in Palestine, we decided to stop writing out pigs and dogs or our manuscripts and rather pushing the more controversial things. We made a LARP called Till Death Do Us Part. This is a LARP about uh, a wedding between a Palestinian and a foreigner. And um, it takes up a, a couple of controversial things within this quite simple uh, framework. And one is the mixed marriage itself. It's a quite controversial thing, even among liberals, especially if the Palestinian is a girl marrying a European man. We discussed religious conflicts and conflict between tradition and modern way of life. And perhaps the, the most controversial was that the, the groom had a lesbian sister in this LARP. 
which created a lot of tension within uh, within his family. And, and the question of gay rights in Palestine, it's not an easy one. Even when you work with liberals, they are quite conservative when it comes to these questions. But the participants, they really embraced this, and they dived into these characters and dived into taking on much more reactionary roles than they, they could identify with themselves. So, we, when we later this month, we are having two Palestinians coming to the LARP festival Gran Selanna in, in Oslo. They are putting up a game they're called Killed in the Name of Honor. Uh, this is a LARP about honor killing, which uh, costs the life of 26 young Palestinian women last year. Here is one of the authors of this game being interviewed by a local TV station in Palestine after running this LARP on the Beit Beyut festival. I think we have achieved something. It's not only about the press coverage is one thing, but it's really about to see how LARP can be a tool to empower people to overcome social repression and talk about social taboos. And in, in subsequent months, they have also run a game called Screwing the Crew. I don't know if anyone here have heard about Screwing the Crew, but it's a game about open relationships. And uh, I, 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 that's really not something familiar. So what Muhammad said with Arthur, it was very interesting to see, but I don't think it's something for us in Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> but the shadow of oppression in Palestine, it is nothing compared to what we find in the refugee camps in Lebanon. And when we were asked by a member of the Palestine Committee, why are you working with the West Bank all the time? The situation there is so much better. Why aren't you doing anything for the children in Lebanon? And I'm not that fond of, like, what the people you are doing something for is not good enough. But we, we accepted the challenge and went into level three of this, um, call it playing in a social pressure cooker. And this time, we were also going to work with children which was something I had never done before, and we had some people in the group who were really good at this, but it was a new challenge. A refugee camp is a very small place. The camp we worked with is called Rashidiyeh. There is about 30,000 inhabitants on two square uh, just kilometers. And it's under the constant threat of Israeli air raids. It can be threat from Lebanese forces or the various armed groups from Lebanon from rivalry between Fatah and Hamas, and there is so little space, there is nowhere to hide. This is the camp, and it's been there since 1967, so it's a bit like a, uh, a, bit like a mix between a town and a prison. But the worst of all in this place is that there are so many people. There are always somebody to see you, to hear you, to judge you, to check if you act according to the norms that dictate everyday life. And I think that is perhaps the, the worst, uh, even compared to the threat of war. But before we left, we, we asked uh, some people back in Norway, uh, what, uh, what do they play? Or do they tell stories? How do they play in Palestine? In, in the, uh, sorry, in the camps in Lebanon? And he said, um, war. And we asked, okay, and now only war. They throw stones at each other and hit each other with sticks. So, okay, we, we found out that, I don't know if you have seen uh, uh, pictures from, um, uh, from children's LARP in Scandinavia. Uh, they are usually uh, kids hitting each other with buffer swords. And uh, at least if you, if you Google it in Danish, you will get only pictures of uh, buffer swords. If you Google it in Norwegian, you get some other pictures too. Uh, but we, at least we decided we, we don't want to work with um, with um, war in, in this context. Our idea was to take a group of trainers from our partner organization, uh, Al Jalil, and work with them to create something interesting for the kids. Because the kids in, in Rashidiyeh, what they do, the girls, they are mostly at home, they maybe help their mother, and the boys, they hang around in the streets smoking. The favorite spare time activity of uh, the, the boy of one of our hosts was to take his gun and go out and shoot the bird and, and barbecue it. Um, but fortunately, we have heroes like the people in, in Al Jalil that try to create something else. And their way to do this is to never challenge any of the norms. They do everything within the framework, and that way they can make activities for the kids, such as football, basketball, dancing, even for the girls. But it's still very conformist. 
and I think when, when this adult population is under constant pressure, it's very hard for them to open up spaces for the kids to... What we did, we started out with trying to play with the adults, to make them willing to, to play with us, and we had some, uh, some games like this. And um, we quickly, very quickly, we overstepped the line. We saw from Palestine that the young people, they really want to touch a bit, they want to be physical, they want to do the things that they are not supposed to do. But here we played a few minutes and then one of the girls opted out. And then all the other girls, one by one, opted out because it creates this cascade where you are supposed to opt out because this is not a decent thing to do. We had to tidy it up a bit. And um, we, we lost some of the volunteers doing this. Um, but at least we, we kept uh, the important, uh, the, 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 uh, the most enthusiastic of them. But what we discovered also was that once we went over to playing some LARPs, the alibi was much stronger. And I have promised to not put this picture online, actually. It not, doesn't seem that uh, controversial, but it, it can be in a place like this. This is uh, when our destinies meet again. And I think it's fascinating how when you play, you are allowed to, uh, you feel that you are allowed to do something uh, completely different when from what you can normally do. So when we had warmed up these uh, adults, it was time for us to create a LARP. And we wanted to show an example of a children's LARP, and we had pre-made a monster LARP for them. This is uh, our monster. It is made up of trash that we found in the camp. And the idea with this was to show that it's possible to do something without money. We can create monsters for free. Um, the, 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 the concept was that this monster was threatening the village, and the kids has to send the monster back to sleep by throwing water balloons. However, all the water balloons was locked down in a wizard's chest. So they had to walk around and help various characters with riddles to get access to the balloons so that they could uh, repel the terrible monster. And uh, after some hours of riddle solving and communication with different characters, then the monster came to attack. And they managed to repel it with the balloons. And some of the participants, they also went a little bit further. We, uh, we managed to save him uh, in the end. And now it was time for the volunteers to make their own LARP. And we asked them, what do you want to do? And they uh, decided we want to make a LARP about a wolf who is tormenting a village quite similar to the previous one, but okay, we went on with the wolf idea. There are chickens uh, and sheep in the, in the village, and this wolf is coming every day to eat them. After a few days of preparations, preparing props, costumes, roles, groups, all this, we were ready for the big uh, play day, and we were waiting for them to come at one o'clock, and then at one o'clock when, when there are one participant coming. Uh, and we are, oh shit, what are we doing now? Nobody wants to do this. And unfortunately, we have, um, we have uh, the people from Al Jalila who call the basket team and call the football team and call the dancing group. And then a few people are coming in. And we have maybe 20 kids. And okay, this is fine. We can do with 20 kids. So we walk down towards the beach with them. And then, just like we are the, the pipers of Hamelot, out of every small side street, more and more children are coming in from everywhere. And by the time we, we came to the beach, I think we were almost 100 children. We had hardly enough of these plastic gloves to put on their heads and equipment for being sheep. And not to speak about the poor wolf, Hussein, who was this uh, grand man, the leader of the organization, he was going to play the wolf. And all the football boys, they really wanted to be wolf cubs. So he was supposed to have three cubs, but ended up with, uh, I think, uh, 12 or, or 13 of them. So the sheep were living happily in their village with the chickens and the farmer. And then every day this dangerous wolf came. Hussein, who is the leader of the organization and a very well-respected man in the, in the camp, and stole a chicken or a sheep to the, to the great despair of the population of the village. So what to do with this? What can we do with this terrible situation? Well, the village decided we want to make a trap. We want to catch the wolf. So they made a cage, and one chicken was put out as the bait. <laughs> And then uh, 
the plan seemed to work. The wolf was coming, as he always did, and I trapped him. And now the wolf was no longer so uh, so scary. Now he, the tables had turned, and he was sitting in the cage. And I had to discuss what to do with the wolf. And I think I know what the solution would have been in Denmark. But uh, they um, they they talked together, and they decided that um, the wolf uh, has to go away. He has to go to live in the mountains and never come back. And the wolf promised to do this. And uh, they solved this in a very peaceful way, and uh, everyone were happy. And it was an amazing feeling to walk back through the camp at the, after this LARP. Everyone were put, portraying chickens and going, bah, 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 or they were, uh, they were being wolves. And there was one lady who saw us. We were 100 people coming through the streets of the camp, and she just took her, her children and, and held before their eyes, because this is not supposed to happen. This is not something you're supposed to see. But with such a large group and such a strong alibi with the costumes and having played together for the whole day, everyone felt confident about this. And um, we ended the day with some uh, diplomas and uh, a ceremony for the people who had taken part. So I'll try to sum up what have we learned. We have played under oppression in Belarus, in Palestine and in Lebanon. In Belarus, we've played about power abuse, about what is a human worth using the alibis of historical reenactment and education. In Palestine, we didn't play about uh, prison or occupation or, or traitors, but we played about condoms and gays uh, using the alibis, simple alibis of characters. And in Lebanon, we played about the freedom to be crazy and do something you normally are not supposed to do, using opinion leaders and using the foreigners as well as an alibi for the opinion leaders. I think that all these alibis have been created through role-play in some way. And I think it is much easier to talk about oppression from the outside than oppression from the inside. That the social norms is the, the strongest restrictions and the, the most difficult to break out of. But I also think that to talk about something we usually don't talk about, we need to do something that we usually don't do. And even though, when, when you are suppressed, I, I, I still believe that roleplay can provide a very valuable tool of empowerment. The ability to play, it doesn't die under oppression, but it sometimes falls asleep, and we need to wake it up. So, I will just end this with a quote from Najat, our partner in Lebanon at the end of the day, which I, I think it's not hers, but it was so beautiful to, to round off this project when she came to me and say, Martin, I have realized we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Thank you very much.